Hello, everybody. My name is Matt Dobler. A couple of weeks ago, I ran into an article that was called The Jury Trial Reinvented. And as I read through this article, I just was highlighting so much. I was getting so excited about it. I thought to myself, I've got to talk to the person that wrote this article. So sure enough, here I am. I'm, I'm on a call today with Christopher Robertson from the Boston University School of Law. Welcome, Christopher. Thank you so much for joining us today. Happy to be here. Thanks for reaching out. So your thesis in the article that, that, uh, that I read here appears to be that innovations developed during the pandemic could lead to improvements in the performance, efficiency, and accuracy of trials. Can you tell me how you think that could happen? Sure. In this paper with a, a phenomenal uh, junior scholar named Michael Shamas, um, uh, we developed some ideas that I actually started working with prior to the pandemic. Um, I've been doing uh, jury research and consulting with lawyers on their, on their actual cases uh, for over a decade. And in this process, we've worked with over 20,000 mock jurors in various cases that we've tested various versions on. And, and in that process, one of the, the cool contributions we were able to, instead of using a classic you know, uh, focus group where you go and get you know, 12 people in a room and talk to them for a few hours, we were using this methodology of, of crowdsourcing and getting you know, hundreds or a thousand people online for a case and uh, getting their reactions to the case. Um, and so we started thinking about whether these same methods could, could be applied to actually resolve cases, not just as research or as consulting to predict jury behaviors, but actually as a jury. And so sure enough, when the pandemic happened, um, we started seeing some cases move online. There were actually a few highly publicized online trials via Zoom, usually with the consent of the parties. Um, but um, uh, they really, I think, just scratch the surface on what's possible, that we can actually rethink uh, the jury trial so that it is much more efficient, much more accurate, and actually reduces some of the biases that we currently use under the, uh, under, under the status quo uh, that, that tend to disenfranchise um, uh, you know, underrepresented populations and things like that. You used a term there called crowdsourcing. And in your article, you used a great example that I loved about a county fair game in the early 1900s that was uh, an example of illustrating the concept of crowdsourcing. How do you think that that metaphor lends itself to uh, a reinvented jury trial? Yeah, so, you know, uh, this was Sir Francis Galton, you know, he, he was actually here in Massachusetts, he goes to this county fair and, and sees these drunken, uh, these drunken fairgoers guessing the weight of an ox, and, uh, the, but there were hundreds or I think over a thousand of these guesses, and he was really struck to find that the, the median guess was actually within about two pounds of the true answer. And so it, it turns out that more than having, you know, a, a one person scratch their chin and look at it and think about it, really the wisdom of the crowds can converge on the right answer. And I think that's really reflected in the, the framers' um, Sixth and Seventh Amendment uh, rights to a jury trial is the idea that we don't want just, you know, one old white guy in a robe deciding the cases, partly because he could be biased towards creditors and, uh, and instead we want uh, to empower uh, the people, but but the the problem in 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 the way it's been institutionalized, the jury trial is we just have too few people. Um, Twelve is not enough to get a reliable cross section of the community, uh, and it's not enough to avoid sort of bad luck, just sheer outliers throwing a decision. So that's why if we were going to do a poll of the of the public's views on some question, like whether we should have six year olds wear masks in schools or something, like if we we're doing a poll. We wouldn't just ask 12 people that question. We'd want to ask five or 600 people in a jurisdiction or maybe more. So you get you know, a statistical uh, likelihood uh, from the crowd. You need a, a, a significant number, modern statistics teaches us. And the reason that we've, that we've stuck to six or 12 is just because that's what we had to do, right? Because practicality meant that we couldn't, we couldn't get more than 12 people easily together in a place where they could hear the dispute, but we don't have that problem anymore, right? Yeah, I'm not sure how much it was was actual practicality or was just sheer traditionalism, right? I mean, I think we could have built a, a courthouse with seats for 20 or 25 or 30. I mean, we, we could have designed courtrooms more like theaters, um, but, but for whatever reason, we didn't. And I don't think we realized how we were introducing a lot of risk of error, especially in criminal cases uh, where, you know, sometimes life or death or life imprisonment or not is on the line. And the risk produced by only letting 12 people look at it, it's, it's really a, a reckless way to design a system. Now we talk about uh, 
changing the courts and revolutionizing the courts. But you just pointed out an interesting fact there, which uh, which is about traditionalism in the courts. And in your article, uh, you point out that courts rely on prior authority and they hold precedent in the highest of regards. How do you think that an institution that prides itself on being traditional can ever reinvent itself? Yeah, I mean, that's a really important question. I, I can only express hope that, it, that it's more fundamental values of being right and of being fair um, will overcome that. But uh, when I talk about this, this paper uh, in, in front of a, an audience, um, I will start with a PowerPoint that actually is a picture of my own family in front of a bridge here in Concord, Massachusetts. And it's the bridge where the shot was fired, heard around the world, right? And the re rebuilt bridge is, is still there. It's these wood beams, uh, the way it was built in the 1700s. But then my next picture is a picture of the Zakem Bridge, which is this amazing modern example of, of, of modern technology. And if you think how much engineering, bridge engineering has changed you know, over these 200 plus years, you can think of the way the way communication has changed, the way war has changed, the way transit's changed. It's, it's kind of amazing how the jury has not changed at all, except for allowing um, you know, non-whites and, um, and non-males onto the jury. That's really the only significant change that the jury's experienced. So I do hope that the, the legal system can, can come to terms with that and, and, and sort of upgrade. And so one of the many uh, suggestions for reforming the jury trial that your article suggests is the idea that we incorporate more video, basically, and that uh, rather, than, rather than staging live trials, that's the phrase that you use, staging live trials, courts might instead create high quality videos, including all of the normal aspects of a trial. What do you think the pros and cons of that approach are? Well, you know, I actually saw this in my own practice, as probably a lot of your viewers or litigators you know, just in the last 20 years, it's become now routine to video record a deposition. If the case is, is a substantial case at all, you wouldn't just have a transcriptionist, you actually record it. Why? Because either for crossing that witness or for uh, if the witness becomes unavailable, you want to be able to just play that for the trial. But when we do that, we actually have a pretty elaborate dance of designated, designating depot excerpts for that will actually be played by both sides. Um, and it's a beautiful process, actually, because what results is often a much tighter package. You can get an entire seven and a half hour deposition down into often, you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes of trial testimony uh, because you've eliminated all the normal throat clearing and pairing and dodging and repeating. It's the glory of video editing. So I think that's one of the main advantages is through video, we can tighten and sharpen the presentation so much. And that's not only efficient, that actually allows the jurors to pay attention, right? They don't have to get bored out of their mind as someone drones on when dodging and parrying. They can get those, those key excerpts and build them into their understanding of the case. So in addition to that, we think uh, a greater use of video uh, will make live testimony almost obsolete because we can also then use that, that video and reuse it in future cases. Say it's a products liability case. You know, in my experience, about 80% of those cases are about the company and the product and what they knew when and how it was designed. And, and that can really be all nailed down in a single case, I think, and reused uh, for, for future plaintiffs that might have different medical questions and causation. Sure. You take the general causation and you, and you litigate that stuff ahead of time and you put it in the can. And then when you're trying the individual cases, you just play back the general causation pieces and you go and you litigate specific causation, right? Yeah. I think that there's a lot of examples like where video, it, it almost becomes obvious when you think about why aren't we already doing that, right? Yeah. I know my job here is to, is to ask questions and not talk myself, but I got to tell you, I had a trial, boy, it was uh, late, right after Labor Day weekend. So just a, last month, it was my first in-person jury trial since the pandemic started. Um, and I brought my expert in via Zoom. So I, I recorded that ahead of time. And little did I know that the court that I was in has a very peculiar rule it says that any pre-recorded testimony has to be no longer than 90 minutes. And yeah. I was way over 90 minutes. I was, I had blown that rule out of the water. Um, but the rule also said that if you're over 90 minutes, then you get to edit your, your examination. So I, uh, you know, I, 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 am a pretty good video editor. Uh, and I took that, uh, it was probably, probably about two and a half hours. I took that two and a half hours into an editing suite and boy, oh boy, I cut that stuff. I cut, cut all the, like you said, throat clearing, obviously all the objections we worked out. 
Um, I mean, it was a really, it was a really great experience. It, it really, I, like you said, I thought that the testimony was sharper. I thought it was more directed. Uh, it was, it was a great experience. I, I think lawyers need to get away from the idea that that they're winning if they're talking, because that is not true, right? And I, I don't know if did you end up going even below ninety minutes? It might have oh, yeah, well. Sure. Yeah, sure. So did. that's my point. You, you realize that? Wait, I, I actually the tight, the tighter and sharper I can get this. Think of it in terms of signal to noise ratio, right? I want what the jurors to see is the signal, the key points that win my case. And every bit of other stuff that's in there risks distracting the juror. So they missed it. It was lost in the weeds. And so that tightening and sharpening, I think, it's in your interest as a litigator, but it also helps the system get the answer right. Well, that's an interesting segue. I mean, your article suggests that modern trials largely waste the time of jurors. Do you think that there comes a time in our society when jurors say, we've had enough of this nonsense, we've had enough of this process, and perhaps jurors join the great resignation and they say, we're just not doing this anymore. Do you think there comes a risk? There's a risk of, of us getting so far away from a process that's useful that we alienate jurors? I mean, I think we're already there, right? I mean, jury service is the butt of jokes, right? People say, oh, I had to serve on, there's actually entire websites about how to get out of jury service, like what to tell the judge so you don't have to actually serve. Um, it's considered uh, uh, an obsolete uh, you know, uh, a real pain in the butt, a huge waste of their time. And frankly, for, for working class folks, um, it's, it's actually really onerous, like asking them to, you know, take off three days, or in some cases, three weeks or more, um, can, can really, you know, bankrupt them. Um, we just don't have the sort of financial supports in every jurisdiction uh, that, that allows them to maintain their income. And so that then shapes who can actually serve, right? You see um, uh, the folks that are asking for hardship waivers, uh, the more of those we grant, the less representative the jury becomes. Um, so yeah, I think that's already happened. Uh, and it's a, it really breaks my heart because it's a, a key component of our civil civic democracy. How many chances do you have to look someone in the eye and really talk about the issues of our day in a way that's respectful and engaged and powerful, right? you at the end of this day are going to move a million dollars of money and it's empowering. And I think it makes people, when they've had a good experience, it makes them feel better about being a citizen in this, in this democracy. They can have a little faith that the process actually works. Um, and so that's why we, I think there's a civic mandate that we've got to re rejuvenate the jury. So when I'm talking to folks about uh, reinventing jury trials, and I've never used that phrase, but to borrow from your headline, when I'm talking about reinventing jury trials, uh, especially when we're talking about, about remote technology, the, uh, the digital divide always comes up. What are your responses to folks who don't have the necessary technology to, to participate in a reinvented jury trial? So first of all, it's an incredibly important concern, but first of all, a lot of those are the same people who find it really onerous to travel four hours driving to the, to the federal courthouse in the middle of the, the federal district. It's the same people that um, uh, are going to find it really onerous to take off days and days of work. So there's a sense in which we're not making that problem worse. Uh, and I want to suggest we can actually make it better by allowing those people to serve at their local library branch, allowing them to serve at their office, um, and maybe we need to require employers to allow uh, service in the facilities. Um, uh, and ultimately, maybe we even ship people uh, um, tablets to, to perform their service, and we give them a year's worth of free internet, <laughs> right? I mean, that's when you think of the grand scheme, we need to get internet to those places and get people uh, with those devices anyway. If thinking about jury service as the one civic thing is our impetus for doing so, I'm all in for that. And frankly, we need to do that anyway to take advantage of other things like, you know, distant voting and telehealth. That's the next big frontier that we've seen in the pandemic as well. And so the U.S. is behind uh, the rest of the developed world in getting internet out to the people. We charge more for internet access um, than other countries like France. So this is a systematic problem that we need to solve. And, and I think this is another reason to solve it. All right. I got one last question before we go. Uh, you mentioned virtual reality goggles, and it's just such a far out idea. You didn't really cover it much in your article, but uh, just as a, as a fun way to end, I kind of wonder, 
What do you think the future of courts with respect to virtual reality goggles is? Yeah, we think about virtual reality goggles in our paper uh, as helping to address the concern that when people are sitting at home, you know, as, as jurors deciding a case on a screen, they may be less engaged, they might be distracted. And so we think that on the horizon will be the idea that we could actually ship them some VR goggles if they don't already have some. And by wearing the goggles, they will be essentially transported to the court in terms of their eyes and ears. And so it'll get that immersion, they be able to look the defendant, you know, look at the court, uh, and also see the evidence. Uh, other advantages of virtual reality goggles, of course, you could use them for, say, touring a crime site uh, or, uh, or, or other sorts of evidentiary purposes as well. Uh, you could have uh, also um, 3D forms of evidence, like already sometimes litigators are producing, say, a 3D model of a heart to show where the stent was in place and stuff. So 3D goggles would allow uh, jurors to interact with that demonstrative piece of evidence. So I think all that's on the horizon. It's going to happen. Whether it's, you know, one year or 10 years, I think remains to be seen. Yeah, I agree with that. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me. My guest is Christopher Robertson. His article is The Jury Trial Reinvented, and I'll make sure that we have a link to that in the description of this uh, of this video down below. Christopher, thank you so much for joining me today. I'd love for your readers to reach out to me or my co-author, Michael Shamas. Thank we'll you. do it. Great. Thank you, sir.